there. Welcome back to the channel. Today, the scariest looking keyboards. This is my 2024 Halloween episode. I didn't want to offend anyone by saying ugly keyboards, but you can always call it how you see it in the comments, especially if you disagree with me. Some are scary, but not necessarily bad looking or lacking in intelligent industrial design. Others are wanting. I've already published an episode with a top 11 list of some of the best looking keyboards. You might want to check it out after this episode if you haven't already seen it. It's only a top 11 list and there is plenty of great sounding gear out there with great industrial design. Remember, just because I'm not crazy about the industrial design on some of the units on this list doesn't mean I don't like their sonic capabilities. Here's the list. At number 11, the Roland System 1. All those green LED highlights is a turnoff to me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I think it would look cool in a Matrix movie because of all the green. I can definitely see Morpheus jamming on it, but not in my studio. And number 10, and I know I get a lot of grief for this, it's the Nord Lead 2. I don't like the red color of Nord keyboards. I never have, even though I do like the sounds. I know the red keyboard look is their thing. I can hear people power typing into the comments already, but that's okay. Also, the far left placement of the editing controls is a turnoff. Most people are right-handed, and even if they weren't, placing the controls in a centered layout makes them more accessible to all players. And they've done that on some of their other keyboards. They should also spread them out a little more. They look cramped and are jammed into one small area. I'm sure their intent was to get the controls out of the way of the player, but I believe it's unnecessary. At number nine, the Waldorf Blofeld. At first, I wasn't entirely sure why I don't like the industrial design of the Blofeld until I started writing about it in this episode. At first glance, it looks pretty clean. It has high contrast graphics, a logical layout, and a decent screen. I think it's too minimalistic for the complexity of the device. At a price tag of $299 new, it would be hard to fault it for its minimalistic design. Except it's not $299, it's $799. When you have so few controls at this price, it's a lot harder to argue that it's a better experience than software. This is the only device on this list where I delve into price, and maybe I'm not being fair. If you look at, say, another Waldorf product, the MicroQ, which I love, it doesn't have many more controls than the Blofeld. The big difference here is that the MicroQ isn't a current product. It's over 20 years old, and when it came out, it was a fair price for what it offered. The Blofeld is a current product. In the face of all the value products out there, including a slew of Behringer products which feature true analog and oodles of control, I don't see the value. It's hard to recommend the Blofeld over a software synth. Now keep a look out for my insanity pricing video episode that I'm working on. What I've said about the Blofeld here takes center stage in that episode. At number eight, the Phantom X8. I'm just not a fan of the brushed aluminum look on this device. Roland used this look on a series of devices in the early 2000s that include the Phrase Lab MC09 and the MC808. And I owned the MC808 for a while. It's an interesting design. You would think that the metallic surface would reflect a lot of light at your face, but its brush nature seems to minimize that. At least I never had a problem with it on the MC808. A lot of the rotary potentiometers on these series were cheesy and had a lot of wiggle to them. And I noticed that on quite a few devices that I played. I'm also not a fan of the raised window on the graphic display. It looks clunky. It would look more sleek if it were flush or recessed. Roland used this on a lot of their sense of this era. Also, the big lip that extends out under the keyboard is visually unappealing and a hindrance in some setups. Also, dust gathers there. 
It's not the only synth on this list with that design issue. Another thought here, the Casio XWP1 looks like it copied the Roland design from this period, but the P1 came out years later. It sure looks like they ripped off Roland's orange text and silver face, among other things like buttons, dials, and knobs. It makes me wonder if it was a joint venture between the two companies. At number seven, the Prophet 2000. Released in 1985, using a name that conjures up visions of flying cars in the year 2000, is a great marketing ploy. However, it's form over function. With almost 90 membrane buttons and only three rotary potentiometers, it does have a sleekness to it and probably wins the prize for the most membrane buttons on a keyboard. I'm not a fan of membrane buttons. I love the original DX7 but not the membrane buttons. There is an attempt to compartmentalize the buttons by function slash category, but the text of the function categories are light colored text on a black background, and it can be very difficult to read. I would call the text a mixture of mostly pastel colors. Overall, the color scheme is mostly a black body with blue, teal, mauve, white, and gray text with some text appearing on teal, gray, and black backgrounds. That's a lot of colors. Separating the membrane switches into an area of their own with spacing between other function categories would have gone a long way to better industrial design and usability, but it probably would have added cost. From one perspective, it's a marvel of sleekness. From another perspective, it's a real hodgepodge of colors and cramped design. At number six, the Kurzweil 250. There's a lot to like about the Kurzweil 250 and one big negative, it's industrial design. I can forgive the light colored buttons that pick up dirt and oil from even the cleanest hands. I can forgive that the white text is on a light gray background instead of black and it's hard to read. What I can't forgive is the three inch lip on the front edge of the keyboard. If you're playing like a classical pianist, it's fine. But if you're up close to it or leaning over it to get to other keyboards on your rack or other devices, it's a pain. Take a look at the keyboards in your studio. Most of mine have no lip, almost no lip, or a very narrow one. I've never heard people talking about it, but I'm sure some people must have talked about it. And number five, the Moog Source. This is a cute little analog synth, but unlike, for example, the Octave Plateau Cat, which has incredibly clean industrial design, the Source looks like Garfield's personalized synthesizer. If you're unfamiliar with Garfield, you can Google it and you'll see exactly what I mean. Here's a picture of me in a Garfield suit. It's got light blue, dark blue, light orange, dark orange, white, and black graphic elements. The pitch bend wheels are white, so they're gonna get dirty, and the two black potentiometers have metallic caps. Some of the surfaces are also metallic. Some people are going to love its colorful design, but I'm ho-hum on it. It was a huge departure from Moog's previous designs, and I don't think they ever made anything this colorful again, which might make it a collector's item. At number four, Sequential Circuits Max, AKA the 620. I'm not a fan of the metallic fascia with all the decorative horizontal lines. The white and red square buttons are fine, but they protrude significantly beyond the surface. It's much more protrusion than most of the buttons I've seen on other devices, and it looked dated even back in the 80s. This is also true of the LEDs. They protrude substantially through the top of the device. This was a budget synth by Sequential. It would be unfair to be too critical, and that's why it's number four and not number one. At number three, and I love this synth, at least I love the sound of this synth, the Yamaha AN1X. The layout of the knobs and the buttons is simply horrendous. Eight knobs on the left side are surrounded with white, black, 
beige and green backgrounds, incorporating white and black text. There are a few other buttons that have a similar color scheme. For the rest of the unit, it's mostly a bluish gray background with white lettering. I want to love it because it's a very capable virtual analog synth, but it's truly not a beauty pageant winner. At number two, Roland JX3P. I'm not a fan of this synth, even though I made it number one on a budget list. The design of the front panel is not appealing to me. If it were simply white text on all black backgrounds, I might at least give it a partial thumbs up and it wouldn't have made this list. The mixture of metallic controls and cramped compartmentalized multicolored text is a turnoff. At number one, you may have already seen an episode where I proclaimed this synth and its associated tabletop module, the scariest synth. It's the Oberheim Matrix 12 and the Expander. It looks like the control panel that John Connor will use to save us all from AI. It has industrial buttons and controls and several green displays that predate the Matrix movies by about 15 years. They look ominous. As a bonus, these two pieces of gear sound good, at least for what they are, analog synthesizers. Now, some of the gear on this list is not what I would call good looking, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The Oberheim Matrix 12 and the Expander are not what I would call ugly. Let me make that perfectly clear. They are scary. I have a quick story here before I close. In my best looking keyboards episode, I gave the Kronos the number one slot. I like the simplicity of black and white. It has high contrast readability in my studio environment, day or night. That said, I build my own PCs for music production because it saves me money. My current primary PC is getting long in the tooth and it needs to be replaced soon. When I'm ready to pull the trigger, I may do an episode where I build my new computer, you know, as part of the episode. My current PC is an AMD 3900X ASRock Tai Chi X570 motherboard, maxed out 128 gigabytes of RAM with an over the top 1300 watt power supply and an RTX 4070 GPU. It's also in a massive case with a ton of drives. When I set about creating the list of components I was going to buy, I told myself, I don't need RGB on the motherboard, RGB on the memory, or RGB fans. What a waste of money. What did I buy? I bought a motherboard that just happens to have RGB. Now, in my defense, a lot of medium and high-end motherboards include RGB as standard. That's pretty much the way it is these days. So I was going to get RGB on the motherboard no matter what I did, unless I bought a budget motherboard. I also said, what the heck, and spent an extra $50 to get RGB on the four RAM modules. Luckily, the price on the modules dropped a few days later, and New Egg, after a few emails and some prodding, credited me $50 or $60. So it was essentially free. The set of fans I purchased were on sale, and they also have RGB. When I'm composing at night and the studio is dark, the computer looks like the Vegas Strip, but it's under the desk and I don't look at it much. Also, when I'm looking at something like the Kronos or another keyboard, I'm trying to figure out what the knobs and the buttons are and so I can use them to do something. With the, with the computer, it's just entertainment, I suppose. I'm not having to look at any buttons that are flashing at me. I just wanted to say that I'm not adverse to something being colorful. But as I just said, the PC is under my desk, whereas the Kronos is right in front of me. Each to their own. And if you like highly colorful keyboards, you can mention them in the comments. That's it for this scary Halloween edition. Thanks for watching. Take care. And I'll be back in another episode soon.